Hi, John. It's so nice to sit down and be able to chat with you. Before we get into it, could you please tell us a little bit about who you are? Sure. Yeah, it's very nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, so I have, I have a career that's gone a few different directions. So I started out as an engineer doing software engineering, um, then worked in consulting for a little while. Uh, late 90s, I did two startups, one that IPO'd and one that failed in the, in the wrong order. Um, from there, I actually went pretty hardcore into fintech. I ran a mortgage company for a few years, mm -hmm. uh, worked in asset management for a little while, got my CFA along the way, um, and then went back to, got my MBA at Wharton and decided that I was going to flip over to the dark side or the other side or whatever you might call it. And I've been doing venture capital investing for about 12 years now. And started doing fintech before the name fintech had come out. So um, I guess it that makes me old, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so once you made the switch over to more the buy side part of the industry, uh, what did you start with? Uh, I was originally working at a fund called Blumberg Capital, and I was doing early stage seed and Series A investments, mostly in, in finance and fintech, mm -hmm. um, quite global. Actually, we did some in Israel. We did some in uh, Germany, UK, US. Um, done some in Latin America. I've done pretty much every continent except uh, Antarctica now. I've actually Even invested Australia. in Australia as well, yes. Okay. Um, so yeah, all of them covered. And where are you now? I am at a fund called MSNAD Ventures. So tell us more about MSNAD Ventures. Maybe a little bit about the history, overview of the investment thesis. Sure. MSNAD Ventures is a interestingly named. It's named after the single LP, which is one of the largest insurance conglomerates in the world based in Japan called MSNAD Holdings Group. Mm -hmm. We are a small fund based in Silicon Valley and for a fund with a single LP we're actually quite unique. We've only been around for about three years. We've done 60 investments in three years uh, and all over the world again. So very global. Uh, and we look at things that are focused on either the future of insurance or related to insurance, I would say, and also sustainability and creating a better society. So when we think about insurance, we don't just think about the financial part of it. It's the well-being part of it also that we care about. I see. Um, so we're very broad at the end of the day, and, and the definition of what relates to insurance is just very about broad. anything. Yeah. So is there, are there like any broad buckets that you can categorize most of your investments into? I can give you a couple of verticals, I guess. Yeah, so we've got ones. sort of the FinTech and InsurTech, which I think would be sort of natural there. Um, we've done some in security. We've done some in mobility. We've done some in health. Um, and I think, what else? Uh, we're, we're doing, I guess, more and more in health now is what, what I would say we're focused on. But one key thing that we kind of look for across is, a, is data. Okay. We're always looking for things with the data asset. It's funny, I always tell people VCs are not as smart as entrepreneurs, so I'm, I'm a consumer. I'm not a, I'm not a prognosticator. <laughs> so I, always, I, I have tried to train myself to, to figure out if somebody's right when they're coming up with what they think the future looks like as opposed yeah. to me trying to tell them what I think my thesis is. Okay. I think sometimes we have a bit of an, in, uh, of a, an advantage because we see so much in right. terms of being able to pick where those things are going. Right. Um, but well, certainly you have to have some kind of hunch as to where we're coming from and where we're going, right? In terms of the details, it's a fool's, it's a fool's right. errand to try to like really nail it down, that's for sure. But you have to have a direction, yes. some kind of north star. Yes. So what is that? So I think one of the things we're 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 looking at a lot is the um, kind of the intersection of multiple different things. I don't like to use the term embedded because embedded always implies something like specific. Um, like if you think about serving the consumer's needs where they are, mm -hmm. a lot of times it's okay a certain type of consumer and they might be buying these types of products and they might need insurance of this type and they might need this type of service from a bank and it's and it's an and, 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 but it's very consumer focused. So is it a bit of like a hub and smoke bottle where at the end of the day you have like this one primary need that the customer is coming to you for or to the company for and then all of these like ancillary or periphery products are 
I think so. One of the things that's kind of exciting to me about where we're at now is if I go back through sort of the fintech history, I, I talk about waves sometimes. Originally, it. it was mobile payments, and I feel like that was sort of one of the first waves. Mm -hmm. And then we got into lending. And lending was, I, to me, is certainly partly because the regulations was, were a little bit easier to get mm -hmm. into. Then there was more tr actual banking, where you got you know the neobanks coming out. Right. And now we're getting into the insurance. And I think right. the insurance is actually the hardest on the regulatory and the capital side. It, to me, it's probably why it's taken so long to get here. But what's exciting now is I see that there's almost like an unbundling in each one of these verticals and a rebundling, but based on consumer needs. Tell me, I'm not super familiar <laughs> with InsureTech, so tell me a little bit more. So I think InsureTech, what you know, is kind of a it's a it's sort of the same thesis that you would have with a bunch of other things. It needs to be simpler. It needs to be easier. It needs to meet the consumer where they want it. Um, People are leveraging massive amounts of data now to understand risk. When mm -hmm. you think about climate change, when you think about mobility, when you think about some of the things that are facing us today, mm -hmm. the traditional risk models just don't apply. Right. So insurance needs to be changed pretty dramatically to, to handle the next 50 or 100 years. Right. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be sold the same way as it's been sold in the past. So we're looking, it's pretty interesting for us to think about these types of models. So what are the new ways that you can access the consumer, if not the traditional ways? Um, so embedded is actually, I, I just <laughs> said I don't like it, and then now I'm, I'm going to tell you that, I, that it's one of the initial. What do you mean by embedded insurance? So th I think there's different levels of embedded. Okay. You can think about like when you buy a phone, you have a warranty. You don't have an option of whether you get that warranty. It comes with it. So that's right. essentially like an embedded insurance product, like 100% embedded. Right. Then there's the kind of, oh, I, you know, I'm buying my plane ticket and I have the option to buy the additional insurance at checkout. That's kind of a weaker Im embed. Right. Um, but I think we start thinking about where products or services can actually have some sort of a warranty or some sort of a service associated with it that doesn't necessarily have to be purchased separately. Um, so like a buy-as-you-go model for cars? Yes. Got it. Yep. So you're paying for the service <coughs> or service as one completely yeah, we, cohesive Yeah, we package. have a company in Singapore actually called Caro that's done quite well, and they are a very comprehensive car mm -hmm. service, so all the finance, all the repairs, everything. Is it a pay-as-you-go model, meaning the flexibility is inherently, you know, that you don't have to either buy the car or lease the car? Uh, I. They, I think they have a couple of different financial models, but okay. yeah, essentially there is there is financing, which I mm -hmm. guess probably looks a little bit more like traditional lending, but it is a little more pay as you go. Right, it's right, not right. pure leasing or not ownership; it's still ownership. But the embedded component is that it's like this nice little vertically packaged right car package. Yes, got it. Yes, interesting. So, other than InsureTech, what other areas have you been mulling over? <laughs> uh, like I said, we've been doing more in health. Um, I, can you explain the connection there? Yeah, it's actually really interesting. I think as we think about a lot of different things, there's there's always aspects of health that are interesting. So I'll give you one that's a little bit kind of maybe what I would say easy to understand. We have a company that's called Paceline, mm -hmm. and they are a rewards product for exercise. Mm -hmm. So basically, you sign up, you don't have to do anything, and if you work out a certain number of, of times a week, you get a free Starbucks. Or if you do more, you get you know higher level rewards. And you don't have to pay to be a member. No. Okay. Um, so we're explain the business model. So the, well, the business model comes in with the additional services. So we just launched we they just launched a credit card this last week mm -hmm. that gives you points based on your spending plus your exercise. Okay. Got so it. for example, you can get a free i uh, you can get a free iWatch if you keep up your streak of exercises for a certain number of months and you pay a certain amount of money on the card. Okay, got it. So, and then the next level is, now we have data on your heart rate, say. and Monetize on your on all that, and yeah. so there's a life insurance component, and an accident insurance component, there's a health insurance type of thing, product. Yeah. So you know dramatically more about this person than a typical health insurance or life insurance 
company does. I recently came across a company that does almost exactly that, but it's in the crypto space and it's called Sweatcoin. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep, we're, we're aware of that. Um, but, I, but those are the types of models where I think it makes sense. So you've right. now isolated basically people who take their health very seriously. Mm -hmm. And then if you think about the types of partners that they end up with, it's healthy products, it's healthy food, it's exercise equipment, it's things like that that these people like to buy. Right. So the rewards go there, The and you create a nice, a nice positive and cycle. And the entree to the customer is quite unique, right? Because you're not, I mean, no other credit card is sold through a right. rewards program per right. se. exactly. Or an exercise. And, and even the insurance is essentially we're going to embed that as well. So you, right. you might just get that. Or maybe there's levels of, you know, you can get this level for very little or for nothing and then different levels depending on what you need. So the seemingly disparate health vertical that you guys focus on is because of life insurance and health insurance? Yeah, although I, I would argue even some other types of insurance, auto insurance, you know, are you, how are you how are you the day that you're driving? Does that have an impact right. on whether you're going to have an accident or not? That's there's true. there's components of risk in other parts of, of insurance as well that I yeah. think are related to maybe not, you know, overall health, but in some cases maybe the, the health that day or the feeling that day if you're sick. Mm -hmm. Something like that. So the theme that I'm hearing is that there's a lot of focus or at least utilization of alternative data sources, right? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Okay, and that's true for literally all verticals, all aspects of your portfolio. I think so. I, I, I like to use the lending analogy because mm -hmm. if you look at the changes in lending with fintechs, yeah. what they've done is, you know, like Funbox, for example, connects directly to your accounting system and they know exactly where your cash flows are and so right. they have a really good idea of how to underwrite you. Traditionally, banks didn't have that kind of access. They got... Right. A financial statement and they would make a judgment of whether you managed well so the granularity of that data and mm -hmm. the the kind of speci specificity of that data is mm -hmm. really powerful right and so the same kind of things apply for mobility they apply for climate they mm -hmm. apply for health um, and so if you kind of I guess you could almost describe it as risk tech yeah it level. is yeah <laughs> it is do you think just out of curiosity a bit of a random question but do you think that the access to all of that data for, for the company in and of itself or the entity in and of itself is a potential threat to traditional credit agencies like the Experience or the TransUnions of the world? Uh, I, I do think so. Yeah. I mean, I know companies that are trying to build that, essentially. Right. Um, I, it's, it's a little tricky. Now, depending on where you are in the world, TransUnion or Experience doesn't exist. So there's, there's, some, there's a lot of space there for that to just be developed in some right. emerging markets. Right. In the more developed world. Though the world, caveat is they're not used to credit products, so uh, right. you know, a right. bit of a leapfrogging So then you end up there. with, again, these, like, these alternative products. Right. And sometimes they come in where you get credit through your mobile phone, for example. Right. And the usage patterns are actually uh, available for people to be able to underwrite. Mm -hmm. So those types of models I always love to look at. Um, on the credit bureau thing, I think the, the other area where I think a lot of the innovation has come is sort of the lower end of the credit spectrum. What where, so if somebody's got an 800 score and Experian, it's pretty easy to underwrite them. Right. Even 750, it's pretty oh, easy. You mean when you start getting into the alternative credit and the kind of alt A and maybe a little bit lower, Experian and TransUnion don't do as good a job of understanding the granularity there. Right. And so they I kind thought, of treat it as one homogenous. Yeah, credit. and what you find is if you break down the yeah. actual transactions, you'll see that some people maybe don't make that much money but are right. really responsible. Right. And so they would theoretically be in a higher tier, but their credit maybe just hasn't reflected that. Right, right. And you get thin file and some other things like that that are mm -hmm. a little harder for the agencies to do. So I, I think that's where some of the innovation or maybe the disruption is coming from. Mm -hmm. And we'll see where it goes over time. Interesting. So we've talked a lot about you know, these individual micro trends within each of these spaces. Let's go back to the big picture view and look at some of the headwinds that may be facing. I know that we've experienced yeah. so many amazing tailwinds that essentially have accelerated the right. development and right. adoption in the space right. because of COVID, right? Yeah. Just forced digitization, so to speak. Yeah. But what are some of the headwinds? We don't talk a lot about that. It's funny. I feel like the headwinds, part of the reason I think everything has gone up and to the right so much in the last couple of years is because mm -hmm. a lot of the headwinds are not as strong as they used to be. 
Really? Uh, it feels like mean? that to me. Like when I look even at the trends in regulation, for example, the regulators are looking at ways to enable, you know, APIs and data sharing and things like that that are that are enabling innovation in some of these these collaborations between different types of products. Right. Um, I think they're making it a little bit faster now. We'll, we'll maybe leave crypto aside because I think that is very different in different places and some places are very good and some places are pretty hard to operate. Right. But in sort of traditional fintech or an insure tech, mm -hmm. the trends tend to be more and more towards, you know, helping innovators. And mm -hmm. so I, I don't see much, he I don't see as much headwind there as I did a few years ago is I guess what I would so say. So a few years ago you thought regulation was go really going to be one of the primary ones and it's kind of petered out in terms of yeah. the impact. Well, there's a few things that go there. So I think once you've had a couple people that sort of get over the hump, it mm -hmm. gets easier because they've figured out how to do it and right. then other people can kind of follow in their footsteps. Mm -hmm. And I think even the regulators, that makes it easier because they've done it before. So, right. so that smooths the path. So I think that, you know, you get the trailblazers that, that are the ones, often some of the big first, first wave companies that, mm -hmm. that get through that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in insurance, that was always one of the challenges. We're, we're a big investor in a company called Hippo. Um, what they, kind of company? It's a home insurance company, and they use data from drones, and they use data from sensors on your water pipes to see whether or not you've got a leak and stuff like that. The, again, the data mm -hmm. angle. Um, they're about six years old now, and they, I think they're not fully licensed in every state in the U.S. still. Okay. So that gives you an idea of some of it's still not but easy. But they're the first, I'm assuming, or they're one of the first in that in okay. that space. Yeah. Got it. And and uh, licensing is done on a state level for that particular space. In insurance, there's actually the national and the state level, so oh. it gets really fun. That's some doubly some complicated. Things. Yes, exactly. Got it. Yep. So other than other than the diminishing impact of uh, regulatory headwinds, you really don't see any other headwinds. Oh, I, what I, about I mean, privacy? There, there are definitely headwinds. I mean, <laughs> privacy is is one. GDPR and in, in in, uh, At some in point, Europe people are going to wake up to how much data we collect about them, and they might not be so happy. So, the the thing I was that I I don't know is I think there's a generational angle to this too. So on the privacy side, we see some you know younger generations are willing to share what a amazing of amounts of data. The older generations not so much. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't know how that plays out. I do think the the crackdown is coming. So this goes a little bit towards the regulation and the and the privacy. I, I feel like every time we have companies that have an angle that might be a privacy issue, mm -hmm. we look at the data of how the consumers behave, and the tendency is to share. So I don't. I'm not going to say that I understand that 100 percent or that it fits with the way I might behave. But I'm never the person that I always am not. N equals one. Yeah, I always have to look at the data to see how the behaviors are. Yeah. And the behaviors that I see are not very much about privacy, even though people talk about it a lot. Yeah. No, I guess the example that I was kind of mulling over my head in my head when you mentioned that was Facebook, actually. And I'm not saying people are declining their use of Facebook because of privacy concerns primarily, but all of the hoopla that surrounded that has essentially made the product less cool. Yes. Right? Yes. So there are these like secondary knock on effects that right. you have, but then again, they own Instagram. So. Right. So I guess that's <laughs> what I was going to say is yeah. if you look at the WhatsApp or Instagram usage, right. I don't think you'd see those patterns. I think it's more of Facebook becoming less cool than it is right, the, right. the privacy. So uh, unless it's like a GDPR type situation where it's privacy r from a regulatory perspective. You don't necessarily see it being a point of contention on the consumer level. Not so much, although I do think, you know, companies like Apple are making it a bigger deal and I think they're that's going to the the advertising impact of what Apple's cha latest changes are, you know, mm -hmm. uh, is going to be interesting to see if that affects business models and things like that, then you might see privacy becoming a bigger deal. Right. And and then to me a lot of it has to do with product design at the at from the outset. Mm -hmm. If you design it with that in mind, you know, mm -hmm. there's companies like Signal and stuff like that that have that have focused very much on privacy. Right. To a certain extent, I feel like you figure out who your cons customers are and you, you, you know, do what, what those them. are going to yeah. uh, want. Right. Uh, speaking about, speaking of privacy and uh, stuff in that particular realm, what are your thoughts on Web3 and blockchain? in that particular space. Do you have any? I, 
we're not investing too much in it. I will say that. Um, okay. I I think it's here to stay in a big way, and I think that you know when you think about decentralized finance and DeFi, that also I think is is a wave that's coming and is going to be bigger than people realize, and maybe even change all of the infrastructure over mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm a big believer in it in the grand scheme of things. Um, we haven't invested in it too much. Got it. The reason I was asking is because a lot of people that really focus on that space, one of the primary arguments is obviously security and privacy, right? Yes. Okay, interesting. So you guys are in a unique position being a fund with one sole LP. How do you think that differentiates you from other funds uh, that are similar in nature? There's a couple things, I think. I mean, one sole LP uh, is, is fantastic when you think about fundraising because you don't have to have Quite as many conversations, it. so you still have the conversations. They're just different, um, so that that's amazing. I think one thing that's quite different about us is we have full autonomy, and a lot of single LP funds have a pretty tight tie between the LP and the GP. Mm -hmm. um, so we can do a deal in a weekend if we won't need to. Mm -hmm. And I think in today's market, with as much money as there is out there, and some of these deals move so quickly. You have to be able to make a decision, you know, probably, you know, within an hour sometimes, or at least within a day, right? Um, whether you're in or out, and then you have to be able to move. So, mm -hmm. uh, it's the the pace has just dramatically changed in the last couple of years, and I think that's here to stay. So I think this is something that you know we deal with, uh, but but I think everybody's starting to deal with it more now. Got it. I know that you said that you have full autonomy from your GP, but what is the decision-making process uh, within the fund. Yeah, I joke that we flip a coin, but it's not. Uh, I'm sure we have, it's more <laughs> collaborative than that. We have three partners, um, and if the three of us agree on it, then that's the decision. But it, that's it has to decision. be unanimous? Yes. Okay, yes. got it. All right, yeah. well, thank you so much for spending time with me today. We really appreciate you uh, sitting down with us. Thank, thank you, you very much. I really appreciate it as well. It was a great conversation. Great, thanks.